I would like to introduce myself. I'm Lisa Morales. I'm the director of East Alabama Works. And also on the East Alabama Works team is Carl Brady. He'll be serving um, as moderator for our chat box. And Abby Howell, who has been letting you in from our waiting room. Um, it is so hard to believe that um, it's been nearly six months since, since we have all come together. Um, our last quarterly meeting was actually in January. Uh, and who at that point in time would have ever thought that um, we'd be hit by a global pandemic uh, affecting our, our, our world. Um, it's interrupted our society. It's interrupted our workforce. Um, back in March, uh, the Worlds of Work Committee was very busy planning to execute Worlds of Work, gearing up for nearly 8,000 uh, high school eighth graders and juniors um, to experience 10 different career worlds. And we had to postpone Worlds of Work on that Friday, March the 6th, um, when students were set to arrive the next week. Uh, and we know that we had to make a very difficult decision, as did uh, many others who've had to postpone events across, uh, across the world. Um, but we made the right choice at that point in time, uh, and we're excited to, to be back together today. Um, we might be in a virtual world, but we're all still working towards the goal of improving our workforce. So we want to tell you a little bit about um, a few upcoming events that we have uh, in East Alabama. So um, mark your calendars um, for our webinar series. Um, shortly after the pandemic hit, Alabama Works and the Alabama Workforce Council started offering important webinars to help navigate information to understand resources that were available, uh, to hear from state leaders, and provide some timely communication. After about eight weeks, Alabama Works decided to move to more of a monthly program, and we were delighted that the next webinar is going to be on Monday. July 27th at 9.30 in the morning. Um, it's gonna be uh, an introduction and demonstration of the new benefits cliff tool. So we've talked about that um, from time to time. So I think uh, our webinar on Monday is gonna be um, a great opportunity to hear more um, from the leaders that have uh, developed the benefits cliff tool. So look for in information. Uh, it'll be on all of our social media channels. Um, you'll also have some other links that will get you to that um, important webinar. So we're gonna be offering um, leadership skill training. Um, we had taken a break for uh, a short time, uh, especially as the pandemic had, had hit to determine, you know, what was the best um, way to facilitate that. It's gonna be offered um, by East Alabama Works and our regional partners. Our leadership skill training is facilitated by AIDT. It's um, designed to help develop leadership talent within your organization. I've taken um, several of the leadership classes and found them to be truly uh, a great experience. Um, it helps to, to uh, determine what, um, what some gaps are. Um, when East Alabama Works first came into, um, into being, I uh, talked with several uh, leaders uh, around our workforce region and one of the biggest issues that was communicated was the need to develop leaders within their companies. They have a lot of great employees but nobody wanted to be a team leader or a manager. So um, the proven curriculum from AIDT truly helps to develop those leaders. There's three different leadership skill classes, leadership skill one, two, and three. Topics covered include everything from communication, to understanding the different generations and how we all work together and also emotional intel intelligence. So watch your email about those upcoming classes. Leadership skill one will be offered September 10th and 11th and leadership skill two, uh, probably one will also be offered on October 15th and 16th. And then back in April, uh, we unfortunately had to um, also postpone another uh, important event, and that was our Alabama Works Workforce Conference. Um, many of you have been to the workforce conferences in the past, and we were all very excited about being able to attend the one in April. Um, so the, the Alabama Works had to uh, make that difficult decision to postpone due to COVID-19. And as we navigate you know, what we need to do, the planning committee felt it was you know, too important just to uh, wait for the face-to-face -face, um, conference to be offered. So we chose to offer it virtually. So please mark your calendars for um, 
Wednesday, September 16th for um, our virtual workforce conference. More details will come, um, but you definitely want to go ahead and mark your calendar for uh, our fantastic workforce conference event. And so now we're going to um, switch, switch gears to some of our great speakers that we have lined up for today. Um, our first speaker is going to be Andy Green from Jacksonville State University. Andy is no stranger to our workforce meetings. Many of you um, remember back um, probably about a year ago, Andy, I think, that um, you spoke to us about the importance of, of um, the census. You've also spoken at some of our Worlds of Work VIP breakfast about the census. And so we want to um, get a touch point, see where, where things are with the census. Uh, Andy uh, serves as the Director of Continuing Education and Outreach at Jacksonville State University. He is also the co-chair of the Calhoun County Com Complete Count Committee, but is no stranger to our seven counties in our workforce region. Andy's an, uh, an expert on many topics, and the census is just one of those. So during Andy's presentation, feel free to enter any questions you may have for him in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. So join us in welcoming Andy Green. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you to the East Alabama Works uh, entire staff for providing this opportunity today. Uh, I am no stranger to the group, but if you are uh, new to this uh, call today, uh, our conversations about the census did begin a long time ago. I went back and looked. We began talking about this uh, just kind of a, amongst those in the county in August of 2018. And little did we know at that time that when April 1st of 2020 got here that we would uh, not be able to have all of the big census uh, events that we had planned. And so uh, I don't want to belabor the importance of the census necessarily. And I know that some of you have just joined over the telephone. So I'll do my best to uh, let you know what is on screen at the time. Uh, but before I do, what uh, I've, I've added some slides in that, um, that are not in what you're seeing here if you were to download it, but don't worry, Lisa, everything I've added in, you have, okay? Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but I want to make sure that you all know that uh, there is a, a plethora of resources out there uh, that ADECA has made available, but Alabama Counts uh, is the statewide initiative, and uh, there are videos, there are slide decks, there are templates, social media, images, uh, so many resources. I think I looked at as 1.14 gigabytes of data that is made available for us to put out. And they have some things that are categorized, so specifically for the business area. Um, and so what you're seeing today is exactly uh, that with a few things that I've added into it. But um, just the quick thing, as you're communicating, know that the census is only done every 10 years. It's, a, it's a, an opportunity for every household to count those persons in the household. And it really does contain 10 simple questions. And as you, uh, if you can't see it, it says the only answer, the only wrong answer is not giving one. And we've really moved past this educational phase into the response phase. And now we're in this time where uh, we're gonna look at what the response has been so far. So why does the census matter? Um, the census matters obviously for a variety of reasons, but the census does matter. If you will advance that, Miss Lisa, to the next slide. Um, that uh, an accurate count is the only way that we can really capture the number of people. Uh, there is the American Community Survey uh, that is done every year and it goes out to a select number of households, um, but it is not, it, it is used in official capacity, but the census is the official capacity and it has a large impact on the state of Alabama. So you might be asking yourself, how large is that impact? Well, just for the state of Alabama, there's over $13 billion at stake. Uh, the federal programs that are tied to census data is, uh, is, is pretty lengthy. And a lot of those impact all of your respective areas uh, very heavily. And so for me in higher education, for example, uh, that, that is an impact. Uh, but beyond that, uh, in the areas of workforce innovation opportunity, all of those things are at stake. And if you look on the slide here, the things that are affected by funding are healthcare, education, roads and bridges, jobs. And the big thing that's on there is congressional representation. If things hold like they are, or if they even progress a little bit, right now, this time, really a year ago, we were talking about only losing one congressional seat. Uh, and we kind of talked about that as a, well, hey, this is maybe gonna stir people to act. Right now we're at the, and, and it's very close to us losing two seats uh, in Congress. 
And that's two less persons that are advocating for, for us uh, on a daily basis. And so uh, I don't want that to, to happen. And uh, I know that you don't want that to happen so that we can have as much representation. But we're going to look really at the, at the self-response um, chances right now. So uh, self-response, uh, and, and I'm sorry, there, there's another slide in between that about only taking about six minutes. Uh, six minutes would be, you know, very easy to take it. But the three methods are online, on phone, or um, in the mail. And truly, right now, online is the easiest way to do that. But we know that not everyone is comfortable completing something online. But we're having this meeting online. And before we get on our meeting today, I just asked Lisa the question, what was the response to, uh, to attending this meeting online? And, and it seems like that I'm looking at the number of participants here. We've got a great number. I think that people are becoming a little bit more used to doing things online. But members in your community uh, who are not adept at using technology they might need a little bit of extra help. So you and your colleagues that are those trusted people uh, can, can help the self-response rates by going online. And so uh, that's one of the encouragement things that I wanna put out there to you today is, is maybe look at your company or organization hosting a census event. What makes sure everyone within your organization is counted? Uh, because they might live in your community or they live in other communities, but as a community leader and as an organization, as a business in your community, uh, look at partnering with somebody like the Complete Count Committee in Calhoun County. Other counties have those type uh, uh, opportunities as well. Etowah County, I work closely with them too. But reach out to those committees. And if you don't know who to reach out to, reach out to me and I'll find someone there. We just did in Weaver uh, two Saturdays ago in Weaver, Alabama. We had a morning that was uh, the Lions Club said, we'll cook hot dogs. Uh, the Complete Count Committee in Calhoun County arranged for the Kona Ice Truck, which is just the shaved ice. It's frozen water and sugar. Um, and we had that available for people to stop by and get a free hot dog, a free shaved ice and complete the census. And that impact uh, on the community there was tremendous. The number of people that we were able to sign and complete the census that day uh, over the next 10 years is over $600,000 impact based on federal program dollars coming into Calhoun County. Uh, but let's look now, what I was mentioning a minute ago, uh, at our self-response phase, which is um, the time frame, it should be ending here just in a 10 days, but the Census Bureau has extended the self-response phase to October 31st. So that online, on phone, and nailed-in self-response is gonna continue through October 31st, uh, which my communication to you before in timeline was July the 31st. So that began on March the 12th. Most households would have received a card with a geo tag, a, a reference number on there that they could go in and complete it online. You don't have to have that tag to complete it online. Anyone can visit my2020census.gov and complete the census. Right now, there are a lot of questions about displaced uh, college students. So for instance, where I work, uh, and I know Kelly Pierce is on the call with Gaston State, if you had you know, residential students living in your area uh, on April the 1st, but they had to go home due to the school closures or things like that, they should still complete the census for where they would have been on April the 1st, 2020. Uh, but maybe it's the inverse. Uh, maybe you had a student who went somewhere else out, outside of the state. They should complete it for where they would have been on April the 1st, 2020. I'm not going to advocate doing anything that is uh, not allowing the Census Bureau to capture that data correctly. But if they're now in Alabama, maybe you can figure that out with, with that res uh, respective student. Uh, but just note that that date has been extended. One thing that is interesting to note here, though, is enumerators are the persons who go door to door knocking. Right now, there is not great confidence in the Census Bureau putting uh, people door to door in Calhoun County because of the current uh, levels that we have for positive cases. And the Census Bureau is really examining what the, those opportunities are. That's one of the reasons they extended the self-response phase because once the self-response phase would have ended in July, they would have sent enumerators out to the households who had not responded to try to get the count there. It does not look promising that we will have door to door knocking uh, and I, that concerns me because those who have not responded were maybe expecting someone to come knock on their door and that's most likely not going to happen. Uh, I, I'm concerned. So if, if you have any opportunities to reach out within your community, please do so and have people complete that. So let's look now, uh, just the nationwide picture for self-response and all of this data is as of Friday afternoon. It is updated at uh, two o'clock central time. Uh, so you can see the national self-response and what's on screen right now for those who are not watching is uh, just a, a map of the, uh, the 50 states in Puerto Rico. 
Uh, and you can see the, the breakdown. Now, I'm a, I'm a geography uh, major uh, at JSU. That's what I was as an undergraduate student and then have a public administration master's in spatial analysis. So maps are kind of my thing. I love looking at maps. Um, and, but when I look at this map, I see all these different colors and what do they mean? So uh, one of the things that's really funny to note for me down there at the bottom is if you follow that legend along, um, you've, got a, a, you've got these different breaks. So this kind of a dark amber color is anywhere self-response from zero to 15. Uh, so a 15 point swing and then you get to 16 to 30 but then we go to a 10 point swing from 31 to 40 uh, and 41 to 50 and then we get into that blue color if you can find that really kind of baby blue uh, it's 51 to 56 so they go from a 15 point to a 10 point and now we're in this middle ground where it's a five point swing and that stays from 57 to 62 63 to 68 and 69 to 74 beyond that it goes back to a 10 point swing and then a 15 point swing what the census bureau was doing is they're playing with our minds here they're trying to show, look, you only need one more point to get to that next level. We're so driven by achievement and success. And so you find right now that Alabama self-response is 59.8%. So we're really right in the middle of that 57 to 62 range. It would be wonderful for us to get to that next level. But let's look at this maybe broken down for us in the state of Alabama. So for our uh, counties that we're specifically looking at that are here today, uh, the self-response rates uh, are broken out there on the left side with the percentages. Uh, but then also you can see the state as, as a whole. And you do look uh, at the two, the darker the color blue, the higher self-response. So we do have Madison County and Shelby County with the highest self-response. If you're following population trends for the state of Alabama, those are the two counties that are starting, that do have the higher populations. The reason they have the higher populations is because they're responding to the census. And so if we're looking at what is our population the census is that uh, that driving factor so um, looking at our seven county region that's here uh, what's listed out left uh, side of the screen is alphabetical um, and so you look right now Calhoun County where I sit is at 61.6 percent uh, and uh, we have a target in Calhoun County to be at 80 percent self-response so we've got a long way to go uh, to get there uh, other counties have some goals as well I don't, don't want to speak on, the, on their behalf but I don't want you to think about this just in terms of county. Think about this in terms of our region. Uh, what's good for Etowah County is gonna be good for Cherokee County. What's good for Cherokee County is gonna be good for Calhoun County. And I know just like your businesses operate across county lines, your employees come from across county lines, we need to be thinking about this census more collectively uh, than just in our respective city. So if you have the chance to reach out to, to partners and businesses that maybe you're not on this call today, but reach out to them and say, hey, have you seen where our self-response numbers are for the census? Is there anything that y'all are doing that we can maybe help you with on that? Uh, but you kind of get the numbers that are broken down um, and, I, and I won't belabor those. You can go out and view the self-response uh, rates that are out there. Uh, Etowah County has done a very good job. They've been very active and they were late to the game. I'll say Etowah County um, just kind of came about with a complete count committee early this year. Uh, maybe you've even been late 2019 uh, whereas us in Calhoun County, we were starting it in 2018, but Etowah County's leadership has done an excellent job of getting people, calling them to action. Uh, but you can find where you are on that uh, map, and I'm not going to pull the uh, James Spann spiel here if you can't find yourself on the map, uh, but hopefully you know where you are uh, on that map and that you will take some action within your community. So I don't want to, again, tell you the importance of the census. Hopefully you know that. What I want to ask you to do now is see where we are as far as the total count goes and examine all opportunities that you have to be able to get those counts up because if we don't have people knocking door to door we're going to lose a lot of our senior citizens and our hard to count population that we have traditionally relied on answering the door uh, one because the numerators are not going to be out there and two i know that households are going to be reluctant to uh, to open the door to strangers but if there were to be a question i'm happy to entertain that otherwise i will yield my time back to you lisa so I know, Andy, there's a few questions that have been submitted. And Carl, do you want to read those questions for Andy? Yes, I could do that. Uh, you mentioned uh, being able to fill out the census uh, by paper and to mail that in. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit and where, where to get those uh, paper forms and uh, how to do that? Yeah. So. Uh, responding by mail to the 2020 census, um, it is still an option. It is not the preferred option uh, because obviously that's something that does rely on uh, other services to get it there. But uh, there's ways that you, it, it, you um, in mid-April is when the paper questionnaires were going out to households who had not responded online or by phone. 
So if a household has not responded, they should have by phone or online, they should have received from the Census Bureau a, uh, a paper copy of that. If they did not get a paper copy of that, you can actually go online to request a paper copy. Um, and while you're there, you can actually get, you can see what it looks like. So if you have not received one, uh, or if a household hasn't got one, they can go out and get one. And there are some other uh, services. The, the post office in the past has always had those copies. Uh, I've not been into the post office recently to see if they have a 2020 census forms, uh, but the uh, the envelope that is included with that is already um, uh, addressed to the U.S. Census Bureau and the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, so the enclosed envelope that is provided with that allows you to put the information in there. That does not ask for social security number, bank account, or credit card numbers, anything on behalf of a political party, any money or donations. So just be wary, especially if you're working with seniors uh, in your community. This is a, a campaign time. And, and so uh, the word census is not trademarked. And so right now we do have some political parties who like to use the word census in their advertisements. Um, and that's not to be deceptive as much as it is to maybe to call people to read what's there in front of them. But if you're doing it as the uh, questionnaire, you do wanna make sure that it is legitimate. And so if you're uh, uh, trying to obtain one, just make sure you obtain it from the Census Bureau itself. All right, and another question uh, about the, the final day to complete the Census questionnaires. You mentioned October 31st as the extended time for self-response, but what, what will happen after, the, after that? Yeah, the, how, long, the how long will you have to respond? True. The, the, the extensions have happened pretty much all the way through. So in the typical calendar uh, year, 31 December would be when the Census Bureau would have to report to the Office of the President what the count uh, was from the 2020 Census. That kind of has all changed. Um, and so right now the communication is 31 December, excuse me, 31 October is the last day for self-response. That is on phone, online, or in mail. Um, They've already changed it once. I don't know how willing they're going to be to change it again because uh, they do know that unless elections are postponed, uh, which I certainly hope don't happen nationally, um, is that for the uh, midterm elections in 2022, these congressional districts will have to be set before then and, and before qualifying. So I don't foresee a, a true longer extension. I would encourage everyone to have something in by 31 October. And again, if enumerators are going out, then that's where they'll be knocking on the doors, but I would not wait for someone to knock on the door to respond. All right, that's all I have uh, as far as uh, questions submitted. Wonderful, well, if there happens to be any other questions or something, please feel free. You can send those to Lisa, she can send those to me, uh, or my email address is green, G-R-E-E-N, at J-S-U, Dot edu. I'm happy to help uh, in any way that I can, especially putting you in touch with the resources that are hopefully there in your respective location. Thank you again, Lisa. Y'all have a great day. Thank you, Andy. And I appreciate you sharing your email address. I was about to do it on your behalf. So uh, I appreciate who you actually have like the coolest, easiest email address of anybody. Um, but thank you so much. It's really exciting to see where we are um, with the census. Andy has a preview, uh, another meeting that he has actually stepped out of to be here for us. So he's going to depart now. So again, if you have any questions for Andy um, after this meeting, feel free to email um, either East Alabama Works or you can email Andy at uh, green at jsu.edu. Thanks, yes, thank Andy. Thank you. And, and I saw Carl put that out there in the chat for everyone. Thank you, Carl, for doing that. Y'all have a lovely afternoon. Thanks, Andy. So we, that's great information to kind of hear where we are. Um, it is very important information, um, getting that census completed um, and being able to, to ensure that we have every citizen counted uh, in East Alabama. So our next topic is um, about drug addiction and um, we're pleased to be joined by Saram Salasi. Saram is um, with the Executive Director for the Agency for Substance Abuse Prevention. Um, Saram so is, um, in addition to, uh, to being the executive director for um, Agency for Substance Abuse Prevention, is a local leader and professional real estate agent residing in Anniston. So if you need to buy a house, you know who to call. He graduated from Berea College in Berea, Kentucky in 2006 and is a product of both the Anniston City and Talladega County school systems in Alabama. Nice little link there, uh, Saram. So 
Uh, he is a life member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated and serves his community in a number of different roles. In 2008, he chose to move back to Alabama to work with local not-for-profits and has been working in the field of substance abuse prevention for several years. He currently is the executive director of ASAP, Agency for Substance Abuse Prevention, and chair of the State of Alabama Prevention Advisory Board. Saram has been successfully um, received and implemented drug-free communities um, and drug-free community grants, state block grants, opioid grants, and many others. Saram's knowledge, uh, motto is, knowledge is not power, but the op application thereof. And starting from the beginning of workforce development, one of the very, one of the number one issues that all of our employers face is being able to hire people who are drug free. So Saram's presentation today is very timely. Saram is actually going to um, share his screen. So I'm going to stop sharing mine so he can share his. All right, am I up? You are up, Saram. So Great. we're gonna turn it over to Saram. Um, during his presentation, feel free to enter any questions you have for him in the chat box uh, located on the Zoom toolbar and join us in welcoming Saram. All right, thank you guys so very much for having me. Um, as Lisa already mentioned, this is such a timely conversation uh, with everything that's going on, especially even with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we already can see that numbers of substance abuse disorder or substance use disorder are increasing uh, throughout the county, throughout the state, throughout the nation. So uh, my heart definitely even goes out to those who may be in recovery or struggling right now, you know, during these times of uh, quote unquote social distancing. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna get right into the presentation. Um, the reason I reached out to Lisa and I was so happy to find out about these quarterly meetings is because the Department of Mental Health uh, where we get our primary funding that also reaches up to uh, SAMHSA, which is a federal agency, um, they're really pushing for organizations like ours to get more involved in prevention efforts and working with workforce development. As Lisa already mentioned that, you know, you can't have successful companies if you can't hire people that are drug free. So that's where we come in as an agency to do our best to make sure that uh, consumers or individuals don't ever even start to become addicted to any type of substances. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our agency. We are already, as already mentioned, the Agency for Substance Abuse Prevention. We're located here in Calhoun County, uh, right here in Oxford, Alabama. Uh, the personnel that we have on our team, you can see uh, my wonderful staff here. Um, I've been here for several years, and then you have Jason Lindell, Aisha Crook, uh, Mr. Kenneth Johnson, Stacey Jackson, Mrs. Trisha Anderson, uh, Kayla St. Eliard, and our, our wonderful administrative assistant, Ms. Maya Northard, who uh, helps me get on Zoom. Uh, I, I am still fairly young myself, but hey, th this technology is changing all the time, so you need some young people around to keep you sharp, so I really appreciate her as well. All right, so we are Calhoun and Cleburne County's uh, certified prevention agency. So we had to go through uh, pretty much a lot of rigorous steps to be a certified prevention agency for this area. And this area uh, through the Alabama Department of Mental Health is classified as catchment area M-7. So we are obligated to cover both Calhoun and Cleburne counties. Um, you guys pretty much may or may not know the demographics of Calhoun County, so that's just a quick breakdown to let you know the amount of people that we're trying to cover with just a staff of eight people. So you're looking at 118,000 in Calhoun County. And then Cleveland County, you're looking at about almost right at 15,000. Um, and going back to Andy's presentation, again, the census is so very important because if our county numbers are not counted, that affects the federal dollars that come in for things such as not only roads and uh, things of that nature and infrastructure, but also prevention and um, educational efforts like what we do. So it's again, another reason to fill out that census is so we can have more funding to address these issues that we have with substances in our community. Now, everything that we do in prevention is defined by, it's called the CSAP strategies. And here we have several strategies. 
information dissemination, community-based strategies, problem identification and referral, environmental strategies, education, and alternative strategies. And really, I'm going to be focusing on like two or three of these strategies that also tie into work develop, workforce development and what you guys do. So first, one of our biggest strategies is environmental. And that's where we really go out and try to uh, reduce barriers from individuals having access to different substances. So we know that in our communities, one of the primary ways for people to get their hands on drugs, especially opioids, are through their own uh, homes. You know, there may be a grandmother in the home or there may be a cousin that has a prescription that somebody some way, somehow gets access to. And we know how that has uh, turned into the opioid crisis that we currently face because of how highly addictive these substances are. So what we do as an agency, twice a year, we host what are called National Prescription Drug Take Back Days for individuals to bring in any unused and expired prescription drugs. So here you see a picture of a couple of staff. Every time that we do this program, um, we have to have law enforcement that are there on site uh, to make sure that nothing crazy happens. But anyway, we now have, we start off at one location here in Cowan County, and we've now moved up to four locations with one in Cleburne County as well. So these events have been pretty successful and the community really comes out and supports. So in 2019, our drug take back days netted 989.9 pounds, almost a thousand pounds of those unused drugs. So there you see a picture of uh, our Aniston location and all the boxes that came in. So again, our whole job is, uh, I love the phrase by Benjamin Franklin, an ounce, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So our whole goal is even if we can save one individual, we've somewhat done our job. But again, a thousand pounds off of the streets, that's what we're looking for. And we look to increase those numbers in 2020. Now, our previous drug take back day was supposed to happen on April the 25th of this year. But of course, because of the pandemic, that was shut down. So we're trying to think of already in advance new and innovative ways to still get those drugs off the streets while also following CDC guidelines. One other thing that we started to do is uh, prescription drug drop boxes. And here you see us at Downey's Pharmacy in Calhoun County. The, most of the drop boxes in our county are located at uh, police stations. And sometimes, you know, different individuals may not be as comfortable going to the police station, dropping off their old drugs. Well, we started to put one at Downey's Pharmacy and we have another one coming up online that I just can't talk about just yet but we're gonna start putting these throughout the community at various locations where people can drop off not only old prescription drugs, but any type of substances that they no longer uh, want or need. So again, just trying to find ways to increase those barriers uh, to people having access to uh, harmful substances. Here we have our opioid roundtable committee. This was formed um, a couple of years ago. Um, it's pretty much based on the governor's opioid roundtable committee that we implemented and have started to uh, meet on a monthly basis here in Calhoun County. And what this group is, is a group of individuals who have pretty much the same common goal, prevention agencies like us, counselors, uh, treatment agencies, rehab facilities, all of us come to the table together to try to figure out, hey, what is it that you're seeing out in the community and share that information and attack these issues together. Um, again, we do meet monthly. I could get that information to Lisa and would love for anyone to join us on our opioid roundtable committees. This committee came up with different ideas on how to address the issue. And one of those was this next slide, our opioid roundtable event. Now, this was a key event because we had multiple vendors set up that our last event was here at the bridge and we had over uh, 200 participants, but multiple community members and community stakeholders were able to come and get information to share with their family members, with friends and other individuals who need the help and need the information. We also had an expert panel of people, including a representative from our Northern District U.S. Attorney's Office on the panel. 
We had a local doctor. Uh, we had our district attorney, Mr. Brian McVeigh. Um, we also had people uh, coming all the way from Washington, D.C. A representative from uh, Senator Doug Jones' office came and was able to speak and share as well. But again, this roundtable event, and uh, I do have to mention we had Modest Pizza, and those of you guys that are from Calhoun County know all about Modest Pizza. Um, so that was a good draw to get people in as well. But anyway, this, this event was really, really good because all of these individuals came together to get out that information that our community so desperately needs. So again, our whole goal is all about getting the word out so people never start um, to fall victim to substance use disorder. Here's another innovative program that we partner with at Jacksonville State. Again, you guys are looking for people to come into the workforce pretty much ready to go to work and hopefully not have to struggle with substance use disorder. Well, JSU created what's called the Collegiate Recovery Community Program. And that community program, as you can see on the slide, um, pretty much provides a safe place that enables the growth of individuals uh, on campus, you know, socially and academically. So, you know, if there are students who have had issues before in the past or may experience issues, the JSU CRC is there for them. And we partner with the JSU CRC to do different programming, such as a sober tailgate, uh, that some of you guys may have heard about in other programs to make sure that those students need the resource, get the resources and help they really need. The same thing with Gaston State um, at the Ayers campus here. We work with them to get them the necessary information and tools that they need. So hopefully they won't start and fall victim to substance use disorder as well. So now the new um, thing and, and where we need you all to help us with is uh, the workforce development piece and connecting the pieces of the puzzle uh, because I don't believe that different groups like us should work in silos that, you know, we all have common goals. You guys want successful businesses. We want people not addicted to drugs. So how can we now bring these things together? And we just reached out uh, through one of you all's programs with United Way uh, working on the Workforce Connections Program. So right now we're in the process of working with United Way. Of course, COVID-19 is affecting this, but we're going to help recruit students. We're going to get them a curriculum training that they need to, again, hopefully not have to fall into lives of substance use disorder. And um, again, just help them be successful throughout their lifespan. So that's kind of our main goal right now and that the state is really pushing us to do. And again, we're open for suggestions. We have tons of resources here at our agency. Uh, from pamphlets to different brochures, video information to share with uh, your workers or your companies, whatever you guys may need to help your company and your workers be successful, that's where we come in. And again, that's what we're all about, trying to now connect these pieces to workforce development. And that is all of my presentation. So Carl, I think you've been monitoring the chat box. Are there any questions for Saram? Yeah, the main thing is, uh, Saran, uh, you know, we're, our uh, Region 2 uh, of East Alabama Works uh, represents seven counties. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you guys serve uh, Calhoun and Cleburne. Uh, are you aware of any other programs uh, in the other counties of East Alabama? Yes, what I can do is I can get Lisa the list of the other agencies like ours that are designated to cover those other areas. Again, the state kind of breaks us up into uh, multi, uh, two or three counties or whatever. So, you know, ours is just Calhoun and Cleveland, but there are uh, sister agencies, if you want to use that term, like us, that can get you guys the resources in your own individual counties. So I'll, I'll send Lisa that list. Yeah, that's all I have. Right. Saran, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate you bringing that information um, forward to us. Um, it's very important and, and very timely. So thank you very much. Thank you, guys. So next up, um, our speaker is um, somebody who also is no stranger to East Alabama, and that is Tim McCartney. Tim is the chair of the Alabama Workforce Council and been part of region, um, our workforce region since before it was even conceived. Um, Tim is going to bring forward um, a discussion on the state of the Alabama workforce. Um, if you were watching some of the um, webinars put on by Alabama Works, 
then Tim is a face that you are very familiar with. And um, we are very pleased to have Tim join us. And we're going to um, just let Tim be able to see the screen and see all the participants. Um, so Tim, we're going to turn it over to you. Um, I'm sure you probably enjoyed hearing both Andy and Saram um, mention roads and bridges. I'm sure, sure that um, roads are still very near and dear to your heart. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Tim McCartney. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank Lisa and the board of East Alabama Works for allowing me the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Uh, I really appreciate all the work that y'all do for the region. Uh, your work is very important and it's very helpful to, to everyone in the region and the state. Uh, I also want to publicly thank Lisa for the time that she served on the executive committee for Alabama Workforce Council this past year. Uh, even though she was uh, cut short on her actual in-person meetings due to the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, she provided me and other executive committee members with valuable insights uh, and advice during her time. So I really appreciate that and I look forward to continue working with Lisa. So uh, first I want to give you a little bit of background information on who I am and how I got involved in Alabama Workforce Council. And I apologize to those of you that were uh, on the PPP committee meeting back in June because a lot of this is going to be some of the same information I covered back then, but I've got some updated statistics on the unemployment. So anyway, I was, uh, although I was born in Tampa, Florida, I spent the majority of my life as a resident of Gadsden. Uh, I have a civil engineering degree from Auburn University and an MBA from Embry in Atlanta. Uh, I'm a highway contractor by trade, hence the uh, comment from, from Lisa about roads and bridges. They are dear to my heart. Uh, I was born into a family-owned highway construction business. Uh, my grandfather began the business in 1945, and he was followed into the business by his only son, my father, uh, back in 1962. And after that, uh, my brother and I joined the business after we both finished college back in uh, 79 and 80. Uh, my brother and I worked construction every summer from the time we were 13 until we joined the company full time. Uh, I was raised by parents and, and both sets of grandparents that believed hard work was the best way to teach someone how to learn a skill and earn a living. And today I've uh, learned a new term for that. We call that work-based learning today, but back then we just called it learning how to work. I was uh, appointed to the Region 2 Workforce Council Board when it was created during Governor Riley's second term. In 2014, I was appointed to the original Alabama Workforce Council's uh, board during Governor Bentley's administration. Then in 2018, I was appointed to the chairman of AWC by Governor Ivey. She recently appointed me uh, to a new four-year term, so I think she likes my pay scale, which is basically zero. So anyway, I've enjoyed doing the work for the, for the Workforce Council and enjoy all the, the people on the council. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, the Alabama Workforce Council was created by an act of the legislature back in 2014, and it was to serve as an advisory board to formulate policies, develop innovative educational workforce programming, and discuss issues critical to the workforce development needs of the state. There are currently 35 executive level industry appointees that serve on the uh, AWC. Uh, the council members represent all seven workforce regions across the state. Uh, council members are appointed by the governor, the lieutenant governor, the speaker of the house, and the senate pro temp. We also have seven uh, ex officio members that represent different state government associations and agencies. Uh, Ed Castile's deputy secretary of commerce, uh, Fitzgerald Washington, sector of labor, uh, Dr. Eric Mackey, the superintendent of the uh, uh, State Board, excuse me, State Department of Education, and Keith Phillips from the Alabama Community College System. George Clark is chairman of the Workforce Investment Board. Jim Purcell represents uh, Alabama Commission on Higher Education. And then this year, replacing Lisa from Region 2, we'll have Donnie Jones from Region uh, 3, representing West Alabama Works. Uh, we also work very closely with the governor's office of 
education and workforce transformation and their leader, uh, Nick Moore. We work hand in hand with that group. Well, back in uh, April of 2018, a report entitled Preparing Alabama's Workforce for Opportunity and Growth was presented to Governor Ivey by the AWC. That report serves as the foundation of Governor Ivey's uh, Success Plus plan. Success Plus sets a post-secondary education attainment goal of adding 500,000 credentialed Alabamians to the workforce by the year 2025. The governor's strategy seeks to eliminate barriers that prevent people from entering education and workforce training. Now, adding 500,000 people with a high quality certificate, industry recognized credential or a degree will result in approximately 60% of Alabama's working age population possessing a post-secondary credential. Uh, currently, we only have about 43% of the working age population holding such uh, credentials, degrees, or certificates. Now, 500,000 additional workers, skilled workers, uh, it could be considered an aspirational but attainable goal, and we must continue to work together in order to achieve it. From the time the governor uh, took office in April of 2017, until the advent of the COVID outbreak in the early spring, our state witnessed remarkably improved labor market conditions. Our unemployment rate decreased from 4.7% in April 2017 when she took office to 2.7% in January of this year. And that marks the lowest rate of unemployment in Alabama's 200 year history. The labor force participation rate increased from 57.1% in April of 17 to 58.1% in January of 2020. $8.7 billion in new investment was made in Alabama in 2018. There was $7.1 billion in pledged capital investment for 2019. Uh, with commitments of an additional 13,500 additional jobs. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic hit the state in the spring of this year. Well, Alabama's current unemployment statistics have been drastically reduced due to the pandemic. Our unemployment increased from 2.7% in February to 12.9% in April, which is an increase of 10.2%. In June, the unemployment rate was 7.5%, which is a decrease of 1.4% from the May rate of 9.9%. So you see we, we hit a high back in, uh, in April and we're still going down, but we're still way, way too high. Our labor force participation rate has decreased from the 58.1% rate in, that we met in January of this year to 56.6% in June. Between March 14th of this year and July 11th, 662,476 Alabamians filed initial unemployment claims. Obviously, that is greater than the number of the 500,000 additional credential workers that we need to add to Alabama workforce by 2025 to achieve Governor Ivey's post-secondary attainment goal. Judging from the current numbers, we've got a lot to do to achieve our goal of creating those 500,000 additional skilled workers. In the words of Built to Last author Jim Collins, our goal can be considered a BHAG. A BHAG is a big, hairy, audacious goal. But in my opinion, if we continue to work together and head in the same direction, we can still get there. And every day we delay is a lost opportunity. Before the pandemic hit, we had a shortage of skilled workers in Alabama, but we had extremely low unemployment. Now we've got just the reverse. We have still got a shortage of skilled workers, but we have an unprecedented number of unemployed people, many of whom may not be going back to work in the same business where they were previously employed. So it's gonna take some time to correct the situation. 
but there ain't any better time to begin the process than today. Each one of you on this call can make a difference. Each one of you can positively impact someone that's either currently in the education pipeline, unemployed, or underemployed. Uh, my priest recently made a statement that stuck with me, and I've continued to repeat uh, this year. And he said that God doesn't call on the equipped. He equips the called. And I think that applies to all of us. We don't need to wait for perfect conditions to occur before getting involved in improving our workforce. Frankly, perfect conditions won't ever happen. We have to deal with the circumstances as they're presented to us. So as the old Nike slogan said, just do it. There are literally thousands of people in this state that need help uh, to either enter the workforce for the first time or re-enter it after being dislocated by the pandemic. Uh, I've got some suggestions on what we can all do to improve our workforce and the living standards of our fellow citizens. Number one, you can continue to first participate in these regional workforce council meetings and workforce uh, uh, regional meetings. They need your participation and input and the region needs uh, the input. Andy made a great point about we need to think about regional uh, workers, regional citizens. We, work, we want to work statewide as well, but it's really important to start some regions. Uh, you can volunteer at local K through 12 schools. I know there's some, uh, a lot of teachers on the call today, and I want y'all to reach out to these people. We need a lot of times uh, industries hesitant to get involved because they don't feel like they're going to be welcome. At the same time. I know the educators may be hesitant in asking industry to get involved, but we got to get together and, and work together. I think uh, industry can volunteer to teach classes. Uh, you can speak to students about what you do in your personal career. Uh, talk about the level of education you need to get a job like you hold and related salaries and, and benefits available. Uh, don't assume that kids or, or students know what your career involves because they probably have no clue, or worse, they may have a completely inaccurate understanding of it. I know that's true for my own guests. And you make assumptions that people know what you do, but I, I trust me, they don't. You can mentor young people within your community. Uh, you need to let them see that you care about them as individuals, not just someone that you want to employ. As uh, Zig Ziglar, great salesman and speaker, used to say, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You can be a mentor for programs like Best Robotics, uh, Skills USA competitions, and many, many other school programs. There are numerous opportunities within your schools where you can help. Uh, you can serve on your local high school career and technical education advisory boards. I serve on one here in in Etowah County, and I know there's those teachers, instructors, and administrators are looking for people from the industry to help them understand what they need to be, uh, the skills they need to be teaching the students to be successful in your companies. Uh, you can sponsor their events like Skills USA. I know there's always a need for, for sponsors for the Skills USA competitions, and there's many, many other competitions and, and uh, programs you can help in. You can donate equipment. I know there's a lot of people out there that have uh, uh, equipment you can donate that will help uh, improve skills through these CTE programs. And then you need to do the same, not just with K-12, but through the community college uh, CTE programs. Uh, you need to represent your company or agency in local job fairs or uh, world of work events. And we're gonna have them again in person. I just I hope it's sooner than later. Uh, but you need to make your company or agency familiar to your community as a good place to get a job. Uh, you can offer summer internships for career coaches to enable them to learn firsthand about what jobs your agency or company has to offer. Career coaches are many times the first point of contact for many students and sometimes the only point of contact for students to learn about the job development to them. So we really would like the career coaches to get out there and get some hands-on experience and understand what your companies have to offer and what it takes to be 
successful in this company. Uh, you can sponsor apprenticeships within your agency or company. I need to work with Josh Laney down at uh, Alabama Office of Apprenticeships to set those up. Uh, you can speak to local civic groups about what great opportunities are available to educate and train the unemployed or the underemployed. I know, uh, speak to Steve Hildebrand, I think he's on the call here. He'll put you on several of the groups he's, he's involved in because I know they're always looking for speakers. Uh, we also need to demand excellence from our educational systems. We can commit, continue to rank last in national assessment tests. Our standing in education speaks volumes about who we are as a state. Our state's future depends on making our educational system best in class. So before I close, I want to point out a report entitled Why Education Matters. The report was published in 2019 by the Business Education Alliance, or BEA, at the request of the AWC. The report takes a deep dive on the current status of our state's education system and why it's important that we must improve it. I urge you all to read the report, and you can find it on the BEA website, which is BEA.org. If you think about it, uh, workforce development starts at home. Parents must take ownership of being their children's first and best teacher. As we all know, that's easier said than done. In my opinion, it's not the responsibility for government to provide everyone a good job. However, it is government's responsibility to provide a framework for all of our citizens to receive the education and skills necessary to obtain a living wage or a better paying job. Industry should not depend upon government to provide them the workers that they need. Industry must do its part in training people the skills necessary to be successful in their companies. Industry must participate in the educational system and associated training programs required to create a strong workforce pipeline for our people. Business is the largest consumer of the education system's product, is graduates. So we have to improve our educational outcomes for all of our citizens. The AWC stands firm in its commitment to be an active partner with the Alabama State Department of Education, the Alabama Community College System, and our four-year institutions. It's imperative that we achieve better results from our education systems in order that we can maximize our state's potential. We all have responsibility to create an environment without, within Alabama where our citizens that are willing to put forth the effort can thrive. We have responsibility to create an equitable education system where everyone in our state has opportunity to obtain an education to the highest level of their ability regardless of their economic status. It's been said that you can achieve anything you want in life as long as you don't care who gets the credit. So when we all work together with a common goal, we can achieve extraordinary results. And I look forward to working with all of y'all in the future. If there's anything I can do to help you, just reach out to me. I uh, think all my, my information is on the website. Or I can be reached at jtmccartney58 at gmail.com. Again, Lisa and the board, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you this afternoon. Thanks a lot. Lisa, you're muted. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate that. <laughs> I muted myself because um, all the amber alerts that were coming across. I wanted to make sure that they didn't interrupt our meeting. And I believe those amber alerts probably caused uh, several people to get booted off the, the Zoom call and, and several of you had to reconnect. We appreciate you um, choosing to reconnect after you got uh, disconnected. Thank you so much for, for continuing to, to be part of our meeting. So um, with um, Tim, thank you so much again for bringing forth those great words. Just to, um, say a couple of things. Um, Tim, the career coaches that are on the call really appreciate the shout out. Um, I got several text messages 
Um, and also there are several from maybe some uh, CTE or career tech directors um, that also appreciated the, the shout outs for work-based learning and connecting um, the uh, uh, either equipment or job opportunities. Uh, Tim, you also mentioned apprenticeships. So um, just want to give you um, our audience a little update of um, what's to come for our October meeting. Um, our next uh, East Alabama Works quarterly meeting, um, one of our guests will be Kristen Holder. She's a project manager with the Alabama Office of Apprenticeship. And so uh, October will be a great opportunity for everybody to be able to uh, learn more about apprenticeships, how you can work um, um, and find out more um, ways to make apprenticeships work for your company and for your job seekers. So our next quarterly workforce meeting is October 20th. Um, at this point in time, we don't know if it's gonna be by Zoom uh, or if it's gonna be in person. We're probably going to assume it may be by, by Zoom. If it is by Zoom, we might have to um, offer prizes for those who choose to turn their video cameras on uh, so we can see all of your faces uh, or have some sort of game or activity. But um, so we're looking forward to that, that quarterly meeting. Um, this is a great way to, uh, to connect um, with everybody and, and share that information. Uh, so just a quick reminder of our, um, some upcoming opportunities. Uh, the Alabama Works webinar about the Benefits Cliff will be on Monday, July 27th at 9.30 in the morning. And we will send that information out to you uh, via uh, constant contact uh, uh, tomorrow. Also uh, coming up, the Leadership Skills Training, Leadership One, will be offered September 10th and 11th, and also on October 15th and 16th. And again, that may be virtual or it may be in person. Uh, we will uh, keep you updated with, with that. And then uh, go ahead and save the date for the Alabama Works Virtual Workforce Conference. Again, a great opportunity uh, to learn a lot of information that's very timely and very important. Uh, Wednesday, September 16th, 2020. And that information will come to you again via, um, via constant contact. Carl, is there any other questions in the chat box for either t uh, Tim or Saram that we no might need? To I'm sorry. Uh, just want to make sure we uh, ask any questions that people had on their minds. No questions in the chat box. I did want to add, though, that the Amber Alerts that you mentioned are local. It's rare that we get one local. This was from the uh, uh, Etowah County Sheriff's Office, a 19-month-old child uh, out of the Altoona area. So. You might want to check into that if you had a, have a chance to look into that. So on behalf of the Board of, Board of Directors for East Alabama Works and the staff, we appreciate you taking time today to be part of the meeting. Thank you to Tim McCartney, Chair of the Alabama Workforce Council, Saram Salasi for uh, presenting from the uh, Agency for Substance Abuse Prevention, and Andy Green to talk about the census. Uh, many thanks to you all, and we look forward to seeing you at our next quarterly workforce meeting in October. Have a great day.